What's going on guys, the Root Strong Podcast, episode number 23 with Brian McKenzie, the art of breath, the unplugged guy, the guy that I've been watching to actually utilize protocols to help with my athletes breathing and recovery. I actually did a podcast, or not a podcast, a YouTube video on this particular protocol that he utilizes in the art of breath certification. So we go over a lot of stuff pertaining breath work, but also going over you know training modalities for the combat sport athlete along with any other athlete that's trying to increase their output and their aerobic capacity through proper means of breathing. But before we do that, I have to hit the sponsors, ReviveMD, ReviveSups.com, go check it out. Go ahead and check out my very own athlete stack, Phil DeRue's athlete stack, now available for a limited time on sale price and you can get the discount code if you go ahead and use Strong 20 at checkout to get 20% off your final purchase. That's my, my full athlete stack that I use for myself and for my athletes. We're talking about for recovery and for overall performance. These supplements do work, trust me. They are tried and proven and they are not fancy. There is no proprietary blend. There actually is true uh, benefits from these particular substances because again, it's actually something that you can use from the market that will help you engage in all your activities. So go ahead and check it out on revivesubs.com. Also, make sure you check out my mentorship program, my online coaching course that is available now. We have well over 250 coaches from around the world. We are building a community of coaches that are willing to help each other out, which is very, very special to me. Also, you get access to that portal for life. So it's a one-time fee and you get access forever. So again, I urge you to check it out if you're looking to follow some of the protocols and methods that I use with my athletes. Now, let's get on to the podcast. somewhere else to keep going that little voice in your head is trying to stop you from getting to where you want to be be successful and keep moving forward with your host and world-renowned strength and conditioning coach Phil Delroux. I know that a yeah. lot of people probably know who you are but just for you know just for the new guys coming in or not you know that are listeners let's go up go after that let's see where you uh where you started and how you got to the place where you're at now yeah. Okay. So I, um, I was a short course sprinter as, uh, in swimming as a kid and I skateboarded and grew up BMXing bike bikes. Um, I was insanely active. It's the only thing that saved my life. I hated school. I hated the way that we learned. I hated the way I was taught. Um, I did enough school so that I could play sports <laughs> and that was it. And uh, when I got when, when when I got into college, I was over it by that time. When I finally made sense and I started getting into exercise science, mm -hmm. I kind of just pivoted because I had so many different questions, and I took kind of more of a mentorship role from a guy from a Russian guy. Mm -hmm. His name's Dr. Nicholas Romanoff. Yeah. He was the, okay. Yeah. He yeah. The proposed method of running. Okay. Um, you know, and this this was well after school at some point, but I got really into movement very early on in my career. So I've been coaching for roughly 20 years uh, professionally. And I got into it because I was really good at taking busted ass endurance athletes and getting them really actually fit and healthy. Um, we did strength and conditioning. Um, you know, we did movement analysis stuff, all stuff you're very versed in. Right. And, but nobody in the endurance world was really doing any of this stuff back then. Mm -hmm. um, it was very interesting. Everything was kind of like BOSU ball, stability type stuff, like, you know, intense yoga. It wasn't squatting. It wasn't lifting. It wasn't any, and I was doing that stuff. Um, you know, like I was the first one to introduce kettlebells at the gym I was at. Like nobody had even seen kettlebells at the time, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I got into the whole movement thing, endurance sports and um, teaching running mechanics. And that's how I kind of fell in love with what I'm doing. Yeah. And that led down the road to uh, breath work. Mm -hmm. um, when somebody handed me a training mask, elevation training mask, and I laughed and I was like, this isn't going to do shit for elevation. Um, I've studied altitude. I've played with it. This doesn't change the pressure. It's not going to change the oxygen concentration in my blood. Yeah. Um, but I put it on anyway. When I put it on, I took a breath and 
is immediately when I took a breath, I sat up and I was like, oh shit. And I went, fuck, there's, we missed something. <laughs> and so I just started playing around. I was like, I could give this to my athletes that are all over the world. Yeah. When they're warming up, and okay. they're going to engage their core. They're like they're gonna they're gonna organize themselves better because they gotta breathe. They gotta use that diaphragm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the, I I got super interested in that, and then figured out, oh yeah, we got a breathing resist a resistance breathing device on our face. It's called a nose. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if I shut your mouth, <laughs> you're gonna force that diaphragm into a bet. You know, like you're gonna it's gonna turn on more. You're gonna get organized more, and so it just trickled down, and then I started really looking at the physiology behind it. Nobody was looking at the physiology behind breath work. Really? I, 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 yeah, That's nobody's really doing it. I mean, and yet it's the one thing we do to understand energy and, um, you know, what we're doing metabolically. And yeah. so I started, we started really pulling it apart and looking at the, you know, in the minutia of it all. Mm -hmm. um, and then that led into me kind of understanding some things because I was, applying this stuff not only to athletes all over the world di very very different athlete spectrums too and we're talking crossfit mma um wrestlers rowers endurance athletes just like big wave surfers i started seeing that people were responding very differently to very to, to different protocols and so we started look i started looking into the neurobiological side of stuff and how that framework sets up with breathing and it just you know it, it just led me into things with research at stanford um relationships with very very intelligent people um who are studying a lot of very deep stuff that pulled me in with them to understand more of what was going on and this kind of pushed me into a place to where i'm a very i guess i'm kind of a unicorn it, it, per se, in terms of understanding breath control as it relates to human performance. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, you've done a lot, really. I, I've been watching you from afar for a very long time. Um, that's why I was excited to get you on, man, Brian. I, and I think I seen you at the UFC Performance Institute. I think it was last year. And I was like, is that Brian McKenzie? And I didn't want to come up to you like a fanboy, but I was almost going to do it. Oh, man, you should have fucking come up and said hi. Well, I was, I was actually doing a... I was, I was training. I was training there, and um, I think I was doing a video or something like that. But, but yeah, man, I've, I I got unplugged. By the way, I got that book. Oh, awesome. Yeah, I mean, I had Andy on my last podcast before, and me and Andy kind of stay connected through that. And then he was telling me for a long time to get you on. Now I, let's take it back a little bit more. You know, as far as the breath work goes. What's kind of like your basis of assessments that you're going to do with an individual that comes in? If you want to see how, how, you know, how efficient they are with breathing and how they, they could get better from a performance standpoint. Yeah. The, the first and simplest thing is CO2 tolerance test. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the first thing I do with everybody. It, it tells me exactly where they are on the spectrum, mm -hmm. meaning the spectrum of reactivity, whether we're dealing with high anxiety, more sympathetic tone mm -hmm. or not. If I got like, so if I've got somebody who's got, and I don't like, I hate to put this out there right now, but it, it you know, it, when people start looking at the scores, yeah. they don't want to score low. But the fact is, is it's like, look, your score is your score. It's an opportunity regardless of where it's at. The fact is, is I have worked with world champions in many different sports mm -hmm. who are fucking highly reactive and have way more potential like way more potential and, and and we've worked on that we've done that and they've they've seen the differences in the changes gotcha. but so a co2 tolerance test score that's lower that's less than 30 seconds okay. is gonna tell me if somebody is pretty uh sympathetically dominant they're pretty stressed the fuck out mm -hmm. like they are like tissue's not going to respond mobility is going to be poor uh Mental clarity is not going to be there. It's all connected. And, and I mean, it's all connected through CO2, through, through our understanding of carbon dioxide, because it is the metabolic stress messenger of the body. Okay. Now, when you do this test, is, are they taking like a normal breath in and normal breath out? They're holding their, they're holding their nose, holding their breath, and then you're kind of measuring the time? Yeah. So it would be a time when, they, when they've been fairly relaxed for a little bit, and they just sit down and they take it, it, you can take a couple minutes or you could take four or five breaths, right? And it's, it's full breaths, but it's a breathe up and a breathe up is simply, I, you know, it's it, like, it's like one breath every seven to 15 seconds or so, depending on how re, you know, tolerant you are. 
Um, so somebody who's trained at this for some time, my, my breathe up is roughly around 12 to 15 seconds per breath cycle. So that's in and out. And I would just go full in and then out, let go, okay. calm. And then the test is actually off of a full inhale. Once I hit that full inhale, I start a clock and I exhale as long and as slow as I possibly can. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that's a little bit yeah. different. That's a little bit different. I've, I've, I've played around with the Buteco method. Um, I actually got yeah. certified yeah. in oxygen Bolt advanced. Yeah. yeah. I did the bolt score and uh, we do that somewhat. How do you feel about like maximal, uh, maximal breath holds prior to training? And do you feel it can be applicable for, let's say a combat sport athlete? Uh, 100% had John Jones do a couple breath holds before he fought DC. Nice. <laughs> down to work with him. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's absolutely applicable pre-training or pre-competition in any sport. If you want more red blood cells to work with, I would hold your breath for some stressful responses. Yeah, it's funny because uh, I've done some research on it and then I've done it, experimented it with myself and my athletes in the past. And definitely, yeah. like, we've seen tremendous increases in their ability, in their output, um, yeah. you know. And then from – and these are guys that are, that are fairly anaerobic in nature. And they become, yeah. they become more aerobically sound or at least oh, yeah. understand how to breathe properly. And that can yeah. help with all those other energy demands, especially in MMA, man. It's just all over the place, yeah. you know. Yeah. It's, so. it's tough, man. It's tough. But it's like, you know, um, you, you – when, when – it's like when we hear in, 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 in exercise science, like things about oh, more red blood cells, everybody immediately gravitates towards oxygen. Mm -hmm. And I get it, but it's not about that. Mm. It's actually those red blood cells would prefer to carry carbon dioxide. That's exactly what gets rid of the oxygen. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually, I'm, I'm, I'm able to be, if I'm more of an anaerobic athlete, I'm able to stuff more carbon dioxide and get rid of it. So I'm, I'm in a better place mm -hmm. as a result of that, right? So that's where that can help. But it also increases the O2, which means I'm getting more oxygen into the system, which allows me to use more oxygen at higher levels. Gotcha. Okay. And, and so like for me, and also I'm, I'm being selfish and, and everybody knows yeah. that uh, I'm going to ask you questions. Hopefully this helps yes. <laughs> a, lot, a bunch of people well, listening. Well, well, you train your ass off, so it's going to be applicable to anybody who's listening to your show. That's it, man. That's it. So like, so for me, like I like to do sometimes depending on where they're at in camp, uh, mainly getting closer to the fight after we develop that aerobic base, and the ability to take in and utilize oxygen, have that CO2 saturation built up. I like to do high intensity, uh, hypoxic intervals, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll do that primarily with a sled drag or a prowler push variation or something along the lines of that. So I'll have them breathe in, blow out, hold their breath, you know, take whatever energy output they need to do, and then recover nasal, with nasal breathing. Yeah. Um, we've seen tremendous increases in, in just overall yeah. output even with the guys, like I said, with the more of that power endurance background in a sense, you know? Yeah, that's my background. I mean, I, I am a power athlete. I was a short course sprinter, bro. I cheated at every fucking workout that ever happened, and I was the fastest guy on the team. So <laughs> that's the only way I got fast. <laughs> yeah. Is there, now, there was a genetic test that you did, correct? What is that? Yeah. What's the name of that of that genetic test to show what? You go to uh, fitness genes. Fitness uh, genes. Or any, I think every single one of them is doing it now. And yeah. and the g genetic they'll give you a genetic variant where you lean. Most people lean more towards power athletes. Gotcha. Not endurance. Like if you carry that really high level endurance, those are called Kenyans. <laughs> uh, le legitimately, it's like it's. I think it's something like ten percent of the population carries that marker strictly hard hardcore aerobic responder right like uh but so whether you lean more towards aerobic work or you lean more towards this power response right and i lean i think i'm close to 70 percent so i'm yeah I'm, I'm i'm more over on that side but i love the endurance stuff but i also know what it does to me if i go for a three-hour bike bike ride right like, I don't want to do that all the time because I get crushed afterwards. 
So an aerobic responder won't be crushed afterwards, yeah. right? So I, if I develop properly, can go and do that stuff from time to time, but the, the, the byproduct of that becomes, you know, pretty, you know, I, I need a lot more recovery time from that. I got you. That gives me, that gives me a, an interesting question I want to ask you is that, so when you're, cause you're a power endurance type of athlete, mm -hmm. right? Repeat power. Um, yeah. What would you do if you were trying to develop yourself as an endurance athlete? Let's just say that wants to run a marathon or something along. Yeah. I know you did stuff with uh, with Kelly Storette, correct? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And he was primarily he was more anaerobically sound too, as well. He was at the time, although freak, freakishly enough, here's a round peg trying to jam into a square hole. He's an aerobic responder. Ah, uh, okay, okay. That makes sense because his background though, right? Was he a rower? We train the way that we, we train. But here, I mean, look, the interesting thing is, is our current idea or model of, of developing an aerobic base mm -hmm. is flawed mm -hmm. in that we think we need a lot of time under, under this aerobic place and we use like heart rate as that variant. Okay. Heart rate has nothing to do with how I move energy, whether I'm aerobic or not. Okay. It's just, it's just a tachometer. Mm -hmm. So, it, and if it were, if it were true, then if this was the metric for energy, how is it a, a chess player playing chess all day, burn 6,000 calories mm -hmm. sitting down or a free diver can burn up upwards of 600 calories an hour diving and coming up mm -hmm. and their heart rate doesn't go above you know, their heart rate doesn't go higher than your and my resting heart rate. Yeah, it can't. Right? <laughs> it can't, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so there's so many variants to what's going on, but the one thing is 90% of the energy we move has to use oxygen. So how efficient we are with that is critical. So with like my CrossFit athletes or, or the fighters that sometimes I'll work with in developing more of the aerobic side of things, yeah. we strictly... I stick them gear one through gear one through two. So gear one is an equal in and out, nose, nose. Gear two is a fast nasal in, relaxed out, exhale, nose only. Okay. For four weeks. Okay. I've seen I've seen CrossFitters get completely restructured in how they use energy in four weeks. It, it's insane. So but that, it's a kick in the balls because I'm, I'm they sure. have to slow down so much and their ego gets involved. That's what I was going to say. I was say, what, what, ex what protocols are you using for this? It has to be very low intensity in the beginning. Yeah, yeah. we just use like assault bikes. Um, we'll use running if they can handle it. We'll use a, a stationary bike, WAP bikes, et cetera. Um, you know, skiers, ergs, rowers, uh, mm -hmm. just simple things like that. Now, if I'm in a strength and conditioning environment, it's still same thing applies and you're actually going to get bigger bang for your buck. And you're, you're learning that right now with like, Hey, we do sled pushes hypoxically on a negative, And then I let them nasal breathe at the end, like nasal breathe at the end after doing hypoxic work is directly forcing them to take more carbon dioxide load, which is instantly changing how the physiology responds to oxygen automatically getting aerobic training through that. It's just, we're thinking of it in a very different way. So it, it's, the fact is, is the more carbon dioxide that's in, in the environment, it has to get out, right? And the only way to really get out is through that red blood cell. So if it's, there's trillions of oxygen molecules in that re, one red blood cell. Mm -hmm. So the more CO2 I'm sticking in there, the more O2 that's coming out and it's forcing this perfusion of the cell. So if, you know, and if I'm anaerobic, all that oxygen is going to uh, bring down the acidity of the hydrogen, you know, all of this stuff that's becoming acidic in the environment, right? A lot quicker. Mm -hmm. Okay. So with the heart rate, and I know, and we can talk about Unplugged too as well, and how you came about, you know, writing this with Andy. And I, I'm pretty yeah. sure it kind of goes hand in hand with, with uh, like heart rate monitors and things of that nature. Now, do you feel like when you're looking at like a conditioning, for, for instance, are we, are you at least engaging their maximal heart rate and then figuring out percentages from there? Or are we just, you know, utilizing our ability to coach or is it both? Um, I, unless I'm working with somebody that's like at the Tour de France yeah. um, or really, you know, uh, where, 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 
maximal heart rate really plays into a factor. Mm -hmm. I really don't play with heart rate much at all. Now, as a coach, that may not be the best decision because now you can actually monitor a second variable with understanding intensity, right? With heart rate. But if I'm strictly concerned with energy and I've got an athlete that can adhere to the system, your breath is the reason you're, you're moving energy. Without it, you got nothing else. And so what we started to understand was, is when we were, tr when we were putting people on metabolic carts mm -hmm. after we'd been playing with this stuff, it was every single athlete, one after another, where we would start to look at what was going on at a specific heart rate and specific work, mm -hmm. right? Then we'd change what was going on with their breathing. Okay. Hey, Breathe with your mouth open. Breathe with your mouth shut. Breathe one breath every five seconds. One breath every six seconds. And across what we found out was that it doesn't matter who the athlete really was. The moment that mouth opens, you have now moved over towards more anaerobic activity. Well, yeah, you, that makes sense. You cannot. And, and, and the problem is, is that a lot of people are like, including coaches, they're like, that's bullshit. Like you can't, you know, like I got athletes who are running, doing, doing the track stuff and, you know, or running, in, you know, miles and their mouths are open and, you know, they're doing 15 miles with their mouth open and they're perfectly fine. I'm like, yeah, they're primarily leaning into carbohydrate depletion, which oh. is why they have to suck down all this shit where I, I could go out for a three hour ride, maybe drink water once and keep my mouth shut and i'm fine had i done when i did that prior to understanding all of this completely different game you lose more moisture you actually burn through more sugar you start to bonk quicker everything starts to happen so in a negative sh in, in, in this kind of downward spiral so what we looked at was well what is it how, how do these how does breathing play into this energy thing and it goes from gear one to five is what we've come up with in understanding gear one is strictly aerobic. Gear two becomes a lit, like you're starting to get a little further into the aerobic threshold. Mm -hmm. Gear three is where your aerobic threshold is. So it's a fast nose in, nose out. Yeah. And when, I mean, when I started at this, I could maybe get my heart rate up to 140 in gear three. Mm -hmm. I'm 96% of max heart rate gear three now. And that's four years later. This takes time to develop, but the fact is, is it does develop. And, and keep, keep in mind, there's, a, there's anaerobic activity still going on here. But the moment I open my mouth, I've just now offloaded excessive carbon dioxide. The oxygen equivalent, I'm like, dude, there's a reason why most of the oxygen we breathe in comes right back out. We're not absorbing all of that. It, there's so much oxygen coming in. Right. So, so we have this misconstrued idea of what's really going on. And that's why when we got, when I got into the neurobiology of this stuff, it was like, Oh, okay. So carbon dioxide is doing this with the oxygen. It's playing the yin yang with, with our energy, like oxygen's the yin, carbon dioxide's the yang. You can't have the balance without them both. Right. But the brain is basically strictly reacting off of, carbon dioxide and it's set up in the arterial system so the detection centers are in the carotid and the aortic arteries which tells me it's nothing more than a predictive system okay so arteries are going out i'm not even we don't even know what happened yet but yeah. we're, we're but based on what's in the system at the artery we're going to make a guess and that's where we're going to take a breath and so that means I have to develop a relationship to it, which is why we get into the psychology of it. We do a basic CO2 tolerance screen. Mm -hmm. A static screen like the CO2 tolerance test tells me what's going on with the athlete not working. Uh -huh. Now, when I have them work out, like you could develop something cool with what you do, especially with like sled stuff is like, all right, we're going to use like a beat test or something where it's nose only, but you're going to go to m mouth only right? Where's the flips? Where's the switch it, where that happens? That's where their place, that's where we need to work from. So, so Brian, I got a lot of guys. I'm, I'm glad you brought this up because I use the beep test too as well for like field-based yeah. testing. And I'll get a lot of guys that, yeah, they'll start 
with mouth breathing just because they're inefficient at breathing or they just don't know how to nasal breathe or a lot of these guys they're fighters so they have deviated septums that's that's one of the main issues that i have in working around is trying to develop uh, the ability to breathe properly and then yeah. even with that deviated septum to try to open up as much as we possybly can so that we can stay in that parasympathetic state en enough to get what yeah. we need out of it yeah yeah so here where's my camera is it right here you see my nose yeah yeah oh yeah it's so, the left I mean, side I've, I've busted it a couple times right um, and again, your left side nostril your left side nostril is almost like uh, uh, yeah it's 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 almost totally kick but i i'm perfect 96 percent of max heart rate right yeah. like so now you're dealing with fighters these guys are getting their night their, their nose busted up fucking a lot more than i did right I, this happened years ago with me yeah. um now there are going to be problems with the as a result of this right so the best you you can play with is actually getting something like a training mask or an expand along where you've got the ability to change the resistance and it holds in like a mouthpiece, yeah. right? So if they have to switch over, the reason they're staying parasympathetic when we stay nose only is because of the limitation of carbon dioxide out. Okay. So the, if I'm, as we sit here, right? If I inhale through my nose, or I inhale through my mouth, there's no real difference in the absorption of oxygen that happens. Yeah. It's the CO2 out. It's the difference. Okay. And so that restriction of that CO2 then becomes the player in why I'm getting that because it's slowing down the exhale, which is an inhibition of more sympathetic tone. And okay. so it's not that exhaling is parasympathetic. It's exhaling as an inhibition of sympathetic tone. Okay. That makes sense. So yeah. that's why, like, when you're like, oh, take a deep breath, you know what I mean? And yeah. So this is where something like a training mask can come in, and you can play with this, and although they look ridiculous, yeah. fine, get an expand along if you want. To, like, it's a mouthpiece, a scuba mouthpiece that you can adjust on the end to open more air or less air. And even if the most amount of air in and out of that, it's providing enough resistance to slow down the exhale. Okay. Which is forcing us to actually train a little bit differently. So do you want to train the slowing? Obviously you want to train the slowing down of the exhale during training itself, like during an exercise based movement, whatever it be. You're going to want it equal. You're never going to have an, a, a, a really, you're never, it's going to be really hard, man. I mean, I sat there at 200 watts trying to fuck with this for, for a couple of years now. Like I'm trying to hold, do a two second inhale, three second exhale. Right. And it's like, fuck, like it's just, it's very, like it's, it's brutal. But if I, but I could, if I can inhale fat, you know, like uh, slow, I can exhale quick. Right. And that's a much easier way to go. Yeah. Right. So it, it, it just, it provides a different stimulus, but it is, it is what it is. So that's why we focus on kind of that equal in, equal out, like two and a half in, two and a half out. Right. Like if I'm still at one in, one out, that's equal in, equal out. Yeah. Right. So the idea is to be metabolically sound through equality, right? Like the equal in and out, the more, the more I have to move that shit out, the, and, and this is what we don't understand about the mouth is that the like me you me and you talking right now i'm dipping into more i'm literally getting elevated like i'm i'm ramping up i ramp up when i talk there's a reason like it's all connected you know and so energy has to change okay that that's interesting i mean i i kind of had that that feeling of that i just wasn't right on but way you put it makes a lot of sense because i'm looking at the fighters that i'm working with and I'm trying to gauge how much how much they're actually breathing, and a lot of them almost over breathe to a oh, degree. Yeah. Guaranteed, you know? guaranteed. Yeah, I mean, it, of of all the fighters I've observed, the, m most like look, and this isn't fighter exclusive. Of all the athletes I've observed, they're it, it, it's indicative of population, man. Eighty percent of the population or more, it has some form of dyspnea where they've got some sort of a breathing disorder, whether it's over breathing or whatever, it's just going on.
Yeah, that's that's. I think it's almost like a, it, it's one of the worst things for individuals that start a training program. I believe is like first they try to jump into a conditioning program. They don't know how to breathe. Then they can't even get down the street because again they're 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 breathing not optimal or you know in inadequate I should say and, and that's how people drop off of their training programs. But yeah, as far as as far as so let's say for instance. Uh, and we can take the fighters out of it. Let's just say a general person looking to increase their ability to take in oxygen, utilize oxygen. What is going to be a good practice? I did, I did do a video, by the way. I want to make sure that I, I let you know this. I did a video on YouTube, and I made sure that I shouted you out because we did box oh, breathing. Thanks, yeah, we did some, we did some uh, art of breath stuff. And I showed guys how to get ready for a training session and, you know, obviously recover from a training session. We did box breathing for the recovery and then we did breath of fire for, you know, get, increase the energy output um, mm -hmm. to get them ready, right? Now, yeah. as, but like as far as a general person, you don't have to say everything. I'm just saying, yeah. what would be a general way to get them better at breathing and utilizing that oxygen? Yeah, slow controlled breathing once a day. I mean, to start uh, usually in the morning, at least 10 minutes of it. Okay. Just slow, controlled breathing. Yeah. And it's meditation, man. You know, and it's like that, that's, that's where it, it began for me. That's the easiest thing to get people to do. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, slowing that respiration rate down yeah. instantaneously at the beginning of the day grabs a hold of how you're going to manage energy. Mm -hmm. If you start the day, just not even thinking about it and just yeah. boom, I'm just offloading, offloading, like you're already inefficient. Mm -hmm. And so this sets that tone. Then I would say any sort of warm up other than going for hitting, trying to hit some really intense stuff a few times in the warm up should be strictly breathing through your nose. Gotcha. And that, that could be, is that rapid in and out movements? Or is it just like in and slow? No, out? I, I mean it can it can get elevated and rapid, but the idea here is that so mechanically I'm forcing myself to actually use use my diaphragm, get organized a lot better. Yeah. And then physiologically, I'm actually stressing my system more because I'm not allowing for the CO2 to get out. And as we're warming up, that's the, you know, that was one of the biggest things we saw a difference in was warm up time, mm -hmm. you know, and then adding even some hypoxic holds in that warm up is just going to increase the everything. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Yeah. Let me, uh, let me go ahead and get to these, uh, these questions on Instagram. Yeah. Uh, so Tyler Phillips asked, what are the principles to programming for an athlete? Uh, a lot of people adopt the mentality of two sessions a day is too much training. I guess this goes with just training in, yeah. uh, I guess, frequency. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Sessions a day is too much training, but you see pro athletes train hours and hours a day. How can someone do everything they can possibly without overtraining? And he also said, love my work and all that other stuff. So I guess basically saying is how can you not get a person to overtrain? Pay attention. Yeah, hundred percent. <laughs> um, like, like if if you can't put out, you know, I mean, Greg Glassman, bless his heart, fucking one of the greatest things that he that he that I've heard him say is, yeah, performance is your indicator for how much you can do. If your performance doesn't get better, you're doing too much, right? You know, and and I mean, like I do two a day sometimes but my job is to actually work out and pay attention to what I'm doing, working out nice. and understand what I'm doing, working out. So that then I can go talk Galpin yeah. or whoever. And I can go, look, here's what I'm doing. Here's what I'm figuring out. And then it's like somebody else wants, you know, they want me to come in and consult with them on some things. Like I have to understand this shit like real well. Right. And so if I can't put out in workout number two, I need to stop. And that, this is this is like the easiest thing for me to do here. The lowest hanging fruit is breathing. Well, why? Well, so if you're doing a workout that you're supposed to only be, you know, using gear one, two, or three in, yet you feel like you've got to be putting gear four or five in, yeah. and you're not even doing close to the amount of work that you usually do, 
you, you, we got a problem. Yeah, yeah. That makes yep. sense. Okay. All right. I like that. Okay. Yeah. It instantaneously is going to give you feedback. It's like there are days I get up and I go into the gym and train in the other room mm -hmm. and I'm warming up and it's like, ooh, why, man, I gotta, I feel like I gotta breathe heavier right now. And it's like, oh, okay, I'm cooked. I am dealing with more, like, so my, and this is why heart rate is shit at understanding this. That's a huge fluctuation in energy, you know? And yet my heart rate could be pretty similar. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that, that's funny, because I do have, like, uh, some fighters have naturally high heart rates, believe it or not. They can get their heart rate up. That's actually, actually a good thing, man. Yeah, and, and honestly. Reactive heart. Yeah, yeah, like, I get, and, and breathing fine. Not, no, no problems breathing, like. I have a female boxer, Maureen Shea. She's, uh, you know, she's been she's been a two, she's a two-time world champion. She's been in the game forever. She can get a heart rate up to like 185, and 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 you think she's still in an aerobic zone, the way she's breathing. I'm like, what's going on here? But that's just she could be. Put her on a metabolic cart. I mean, yeah. she can keep her mouth shut. Yeah, uh, that's hard. That's, hard. that's hard. She talks a lot. I'm not gonna lie to you. Okay. <laughs> then, then, there you go. <laughs> ah, just kidding. All right, on to the next one. Let's see here. Okay. All right. Uh, will training while using nasal breathing positively impact recovery? And does nasal breathing generally through the day and night also have a positive effect on recovery? Yes. Yes. Those are, yeah. I mean, we've, we've basically already covered everything into the why on that. You're also, I mean, look, man, you're leaving more parasympathetic tone uh -huh. when you're nasal breathing. So, it's instantaneous. I mean, the biggest changes I see across the board, whether it's an athlete, an operator, a doctor, like, and I, I mean, I had an ER doc today who hit me up and wanted some protocols to do and stuff. And he's been following this stuff and he's been new, doing nasal breathing. He's like, dude, I sleep now. Like there's th like, I, I was having sleep problems and now I'm sleeping better. And it's like, it's all directly related to how, how, like, we're the only species that knows that we can manipulate stress for adaptive purposes. Mm -hmm. Like we, we intentionally do that, but we go overboard with that because we're like more, 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 more versus like, Hey, how much more, what am I trying to get at here? Look like, you know, and so how much can you handle and applying this cross boards? It's going to make very quick changes. If you have not done it, if you have been doing it, the changes start to slow down a little bit more. Right. Gotcha, gotcha. That's a good one. All right, let's go to the next one. Um, this one is from actually one of my mentorees that I uh, that I have on my course. He asked, "What kind of breath protocol is best for boxers before competition and during the minute rest between rounds?" So I guess he's asking. Before, yeah, before comp. I would say uh, doing a step up protocol where you're using some sort of breath of fire, but then going into like three really slow controlled breath patterns. Okay. So like a box breathing right after like uh, a breath of fire for like 20, 30 breaths, mm -hmm. then box breathing for three breath cycles, mm -hmm. then breath of like fall. So do that three times, but every time you do the box breathing, let's just say we started at like five, 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 five. Okay. The next set would be six, 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 six. Yep. The next set would be seven, 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 seven. Gotcha. So I'm, I'm ramping up, but then I'm calming down. I'm ramping up and calming down. But I would also, before I did that, before the comp, I would do two or three max breath holds. How, how long do you go before, like, let's say how long out before the fight or before the I competition? I would say about an hour before fight time, I would be doing the breath holds, then do the step up. The step up's only going to take probably, you know, five minutes, but the breath holds, you know, they're going to freak you out a little bit or whatever, but like the, it, it, it's all positive from the breath holds. So just doing three, two or three holds and then doing the step up, you'll have created some stimulus. Then between rounds, uh -huh. we use, and this is what's important in training is to teach this. So not everything should be just nasal only breathing, right? Like in, but using a, a, a gear sequence down. So five, four, three, five, four, three, right? So I go mouth, mouth, nose, mouth, nose, nose. And I go like a five, five, seven, nine mm. instantaneously. So five mouth breaths, seven nose, mouth, 
nine nose nose and stick to the nose nose right after that. Just stay at the nose. That's directly like, that's right after the bell. They're getting that deep. bell fucking sound. Okay. Then. Okay. And then go into nose breathing. Yeah. That nose breathing will just bring a calm yeah. after you've offloaded the CO2, yeah. which is going to create some space in that brain to go, okay, I'm calm. I feel like I can breathe, and now I can listen to my fucking corner. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're looking at about, what are you looking at, a time frame on that one? That's probably about, what, 45 seconds? No, I would say literally if you get the five, seven, because the nine is just going to be continuous, okay. right? So the five, seven, that should take less than 15 seconds. Okay. Oh. If they're dialed in enough, it's literally 15 seconds. So it's just, as yeah. soon as that bell hits, the mouth starts going and then it goes nose mouth and then it's in the nose. Don't just shut your fucking mouth and listen. Yeah. No, nah, I get you. That's the only difficult part is to get them to just kind of focus in, you know, especially if it's a hard fight. Yep. That's the one thing yeah, where look, psychology comes in. Thing mouth shut they're gonna be they're gonna be they're gonna listen more there's a reason why your mouth shuts when i'm talking and why mine shuts when you're talking yeah that makes sense yeah all right yeah cool all right so um let's see here here's a good one that i think that i don't think you ever answered this one but you may have who knows you talk a lot about breath so you may have answered it <laughs> um breathing while cutting weight in like let's say a tub or a sauna right what's the Another one was, what's the optimal oximeter oxygen level in a cut that you don't want to go past? I would say in general, you don't want to go past, what is it, 80, 80% 80 of your SpO2? I mean, like, if you're, if you're, um, I mean, there's got to be a reason for why you're dropping SpO2, yeah. right? Like that, that's, so that, that's altitude training. That, that's just training the system yeah. like for altitude training. And so, um, for a cut, I would, I mean, like when I get in the sauna and I do sauna work, I'm trying to hold one breath every one, every minute or so. Right. So there's one breath cycle every minute. And I can usually at around 180 to 200 degrees, hold that for between 15 and 20 minutes just depends on how well adapted i am well wow. well the wheels start to come off when the stress starts to rise right and so the, the breath then starts to plummet so breath in a sauna for a weight cut is going to be very different because we're not trying to you there yes. yeah so it's just not going you're not trying to accomplish the same thing i am like when i slow down my breathing right yeah. but i would be very Keeping your mouth shut is going to help, but you're going to probably burn the inside of the nose if it's hot enough. Uh, yeah. um, so you need to be aware of that. Um, you know, the hard thing with weight cutting, I mean, this is Andy's world, yeah. you know, um, but it's like you don't want to eat up all that glycogen. Mm -hmm. So over breathing is definitely something you don't want to do. You want to stay as aerobic as possible because then you're going to hold on to fucking more muscle. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think also with that is, is we got to stay in a parasympathetic state. So like and when we're in the bath and like that's about 107 degrees Fahrenheit in a bath. Yeah. So the goal is to keep calm so that you can keep shedding the water and keep, you know, getting the water, the weight off of you. The, when you start to hyperventilate, then you start to get in that sympathetic state that you already are highly stressed out anyways. And yeah. so you're just making it worse and worse or exasperating. So this just lean, this just leans more towards keeping that mouth shut. Yep. Yep. There it is. Simple, but effective. <laughs> Simple, but effective. All right. Uh, I think it's the last one here. And then I got one for my intern that's sitting in on this one. Okay. But, uh, so I say is Brian talks about breath work and reactive stressors. So what are key body movements and response and response that are common when getting uncomfortable, maximizing the stress your body can handle to be aware of so to be aware of so you know how much further you should be able to push in a session. Fuck. 
Can you restate the beginning of I got you. I, I fucking lost it too. Uh, all right. So what are key body movements and responses that are common when getting uncomfortable? Maximizing the stress. Yeah. Maximizing yeah, yeah, yeah. the stress. Okay. You got it. Yeah. So, so look, here's, here's what I, I do. do. Like, I, 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 I did, did an Instagram, Instagram live the other day from uh -huh. my sauna. Hey, I was, in that. I was in that for a little bit too, oh, by right. the way. Yeah, uh, I hopped in for a bit. So I posted a comment because I went and rewatched part of it. Uh -huh. And I caught something. And I was like, all right, so if you come in and you see these comments, you're going to get this. Yeah. I'm getting very uncomfortable even though I didn't seem uncomfortable talking to people. Yeah. And I was starting to like itch myself and like rub myself. And so what happens when we start to get to our limits is we start to move and do things in uncomfortable ways. Uh, Patterns start to set themselves up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and th th this is like, these are like things like, like operators and like you know, CIA folks like that I've worked with talk about, but it's like, like, it's like, dude, you can pick up on people who are really uncomfortable if you get good at it being calm. Yeah. And like having a conversation when they start like itching or rubbing things, uh -huh. those are, these are signs that people are getting uncomfortable and starting to reach limits. That makes sense. And yeah, yeah. And I mean, that it's very important in the tactical community to understand that obviously, because like you got somebody who potentially has a weapon or something like that. Like you got to understand there's going to be a reactive moment or whatever's going on, right. As a cop. So it, the, it, it, it's across the boards. This stuff happens in strength and conditioning too, man. People just start doing weird shit. Like that's our reactive patterns. And that's what we would need to be aware of. That's the, that, I mean, I think that's the most important thing about the breath work is that if you actually apply this stuff, you start picking up on your breathing patterns when you have to do certain things. And the first thing becomes, Oh, I need to mouth breathe. Mm -hmm. It goes way deeper than that. But that's the beginning stages of these things is where I know where the limitations or the reactiveness starts to come in and the limits start to hit it. And the better I get at this, the more fine tuned I get with that. And then, you know, and this is like, you know who Helen Morales is? No. She's a, she's a wrestler. She won the gold medal. Oh, Helen. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah Helen. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. So Andy had me work with her. Okay. She took this as far as when she went and wrestled the gal for the world championship after the Olympics, mm -hmm. the Chinese gal who'd never lost. Yeah. And she's like, Hey, she contacted me after the fight or after the match. And she was like, Hey, I just wanted to call and thank you and tell you how much I appreciated the, all this stuff. And the breath work helped me before. Cause she was, she's your typical high anxiety, anxious fight, you know, fighter before the fight, uh, which is totally normal. Um, and she's like, I just wanted to let you know how I used it. It was pretty interesting. I just picked up on when her breathing patterns changed during the match, I knew when to make a move. Ah, uh, that's nice. And yeah. I was like, bingo. And I didn't need to tell you that. Yeah, it's because yeah. you were doing the work and all of a sudden, it's like every fighter knows if a guy's, if, 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 if my opponent's jaw opens, <sighs> they're gassed, right? Uh, well, there's a lot more to it than that. And if you can start to pick up on breathing patterns, like when I roll, it's like, I know when the guy I'm rolling with or gal I'm rolling with, when their breathing starts to go, all right, perfect. Now I can start to turn it up. Yeah. No, that, that makes sense. I, I've, I've been in situations where like in fights and obviously I've been, I've been in some tough fights, you know, when I was a pro and, and I, re I do remember significantly watching my opponent like chest breathe and breathe through his mouth. And I attacked. Like that a cascade, bro. Yeah. And I didn't even know about this. I was probably like, yeah. I was 20, 21 years old. And I yeah. immediately attacked like that was my prey at that point. Because you do. You, yes, 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 yes. That's it, bro. Yeah. We're fucking, we are animals. We are hardwired for this. You yeah. see something go off on its sympathetic cascade, that yeah. is weak. Get it now. Yeah, I felt like it was there was blood in the water right there. That was blood in the water. That was it. <laughs> That's it, man. That's awesome. Um, you got a question? Yes. Um, can you hear him real quick? Speak up. Yeah, speak yeah up. I can hear him. I can All, hear right. Him. All right, go ahead. Hey, Brian, uh, would you recommend uh, for someone to sleep with some sort of mouth tape on to 
subconsciously yes. teach their yes. body to nose yeah. breathe? It, yeah, first four weeks. Four weeks, just go on to Amazon, buy mouth tape, lip tape, wear it for four weeks, and you'll never really need to deal with it again. Yeah. I, I have actually have it. They, they sent it to me, um, and I was like, man, let me try this out. I did it, and I had probably one of the best night's sleeps that I've had in a long time, so it does definitely yeah. help for sure. What about yeah. training with one? Uh, I, have, I have trained with it, too. I've had guys wear the mouth tape. And yeah, I'm not a big fan of using it when training, but that doesn't mean not to do it. I like, I mean, I keep my mouth shut. I just know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, you know, um, so, but at the beginning, you know, it's tough. But, you know, I mean, look, the thing is, it's like if you go four weeks of like everybody I kind of get intro to as an athlete or whoever, right? If they are brand new to this, the first four weeks are you can't open your mouth in anything you fucking do nothing other than talking and eating and wow. tape your mouth at night yeah i have people who will not tape their mouth they're, they're freaked out they're like i'll just have a panic attack and i'm like i get it that is one thing that i don't like is like anything on my mouth so i had to really put up with it so i get that like i suppose I'm, I'm supposed to wear a night guard because i guess i clinch and I don't even fucking wear that. So my gums are gone. Like, they're, or they're receding like a motherfucker. I'm probably going to have to have dentures and shit. But either way, I'm not putting the shit in. There's an exercise you can do with your tongue. Instead of the tip of your tongue, okay. right? Okay. Think of the back of your tongue and pushing it up to the roof of your mouth. So the front of your tongue is not touching. So you're gonna, it'll lift here. That is where your tongue is supposed to sit, is in the roof of your mouth, but the back of your tongue is supposed to be up. So when we start to do that, it opens up the airway more. So the airway goes from something like this to more like that, mm -hmm. and our teeth don't clench. Gotcha. Okay. And, and it, you, you, start to div you start to divert more to this because the air is now moving freely and it's more comfortable. Okay. Now, do you get that? Do you get that a lot with like guys that are like lifting heavy? Like, it, let's say for instance, I'm going for like a max single, and I'm gonna clinch at some point. Oh shit! Damn, he's really going we're going, we're going through it with this one. No, you hear me? Yeah, there you are. All right, cool. Yeah, so like, yeah. like with the max lift, like a, let's say we're going for like a one rep max here, and I'm squatting. Can you do that while you're squatting, or is that something that I would you wouldn't probably yeah. do? Oh yeah? yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Drive that tongue into the roof of your mouth. Yeah. All right. And if, I mean, look. When I do that, my jaw lifts. Every and that's how our jaws designed. Like I actually, I actually train my jaw. Like I, I use a rubber, this rubber thing that I yeah. chew on, so I develop my jaw more. Yeah. yeah. Right. Like we're missing that. Yeah. I like know. this is important for fighters too. Like, fuck. I mean, and and that retrains how we bite down as well. Gotcha. Okay, that's awesome. All right, all right. So before we go, Brian, uh, yeah. I, I do have two questions that I usually ask all my all my uh, my guests. Yep. One is going to be, and this is going to be interesting for me, for especially this question for you. What is your daily routine look like right now? Yeah. Uh, I wake up somewhere between four thirty and six. Yep. I don't set an alarm. Uh, I move. So I do like simple like sun salutations or just simple movement, joint movement stuff. Water, 20, 30 ounces of water with fucking salt and magnesium in it. Mm -hmm. um, and then I do breath work, whether I'm doing low oxygen training or I'm doing high CO2 tolerance building, whether it's through breath control or breath hold work. Mm -hmm. Then I train. So I work out whether I'm in the gym, strength and conditioning, or I'm on the bike because uh, I, I, I like to ride. Um, and then I'm, I, I, and that goes from basically 10 a.m. is kind of when my day starts. Gotcha. Like okay. For, for like stuff like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And everything. Yeah. So 4.30 or 4.30 to 6 to 10 a.m. is all me getting through stuff. And then it's like I'll go for a walk with the dog at some point, but that's like – and then at night, uh, I'll cook. Like I make sure that I, I, I cook six at least six nights a week. Like okay. cooking is my thing. 
so that I actually pull away from everything I was doing that's involved in the world I am. And I feel creative in it. And it allows me to kind of, I really process and get better ideas when I'm doing stuff like that. Or I'm on a walk, right? And then when I'm sitting in front of the TV chilling, I usually am doing some form of breath control or something as well so that I'm completely downshifting. Yeah, you're, you're a true practitioner, bro. Yeah, it's it, 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 like when it started, it was like five or 10 minutes a day. And now it's like my whole day. I bet, man. That's crazy. I got to get to that point, man. I'm I'm always running and gunning and doing a lot of things. But uh, but that's one thing that I do on a daily basis. And, 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 and it's funny because my day for other stuff does start at about 9, 10 o'clock too as well. So that's, that's funny that you said that. All right. So the, the last question, I'll let you go. What, and this one is like, usually it gets a lot of people thinking, but I, I don't, it doesn't have to be, you know, physical. It could be mental, it could be, you know, spiritual, whatever the case. But what does a, a strong person mean to you? What's the definition of a strong person? <laughs> Someone who understands internally what's going on and knows what those like i hate fucking using this word i don't like talk about it out loud but they know their own boundaries okay right like i know when i'm too stressed i know when i've taken in too much stimulus i know when i've done too much i and i give i share that information like i look at social media as like a lot of people don't like it like they think it's this evil thing and i understand that Social media is nothing more than what our cells do on the most basic level. Yeah. They share information. Yeah. We, are, we, we now have the ability to share up information. Mm-hmm. How authentically and what you're sharing is nothing more than what is going on inside that body of yours. Mm-hmm. And that is what I like. Everybody's telling me and showing me what they're doing. Right. And I see what you're doing, Phil. And I, and I appreciate it. Like, and there's a lot of fucking people out there who I appreciate the work going on. And it's not that I get upset with people who are doing crazy shit, but it's like, I just know what they, who they are. And I know if I want to talk to them or not. (laughs) I want to talk to those people. (laughs) Those aren't strong people. There you go, man. I do appreciate that too, by the way. That's a good compliment coming from you, man. All right. So I'll let you get out and, uh, so you're leaving now, huh? You're going to go travel now? I'm, I'm, I'm on the road four hours going up the mountains, and I'm going to go sit at Bell Campo Farms, man. Perfect, man. Perfect. Well, enjoy it. And, uh, yeah. oh, let people know where they can find you, if you have any the certifications, yeah. everything else. Shift, shiftadapt.com. So Shift is our business, shiftadapt.com. That's where everything I've been talking about is. Um, and um, the uh, Instagram at underscore Brian McKenzie. Um, that's where I just put out a lot of my information pertaining to the stuff we do on shift. The subscription there is in, like crazy. Like we put a ton of all of our webinars are for free for yeah. subscribers. It's like 20 bucks a month right now. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, we, we, we have all the training and breath work. Like it's got breath work in there and then there's breath work integrated with training mm-hmm. in there as well. So you can see it yeah. if you want. Or you could just follow the static breath work and stuff that's going on with that. No, I'm definitely gonna go ahead and uh, and sign up for sure. I want to get want to get some stuff from you and and we'll go further, you know, with the. Yeah, you just you just hit me up and we'll, we'll take care of you. I appreciate that, man. Yeah. All right, guys. So that was the episode. Hope you like it. See you again next time.